Today, we got an image of what Russian President Vladimir Putin wants his people and the world to see about his invasion of Ukraine that has been so strongly condemned by so many. It's a, at a carefully staged rally in which thousands of adoring fans came out to support their dear leader and, as he tells it at least, his noble campaign to liberate the Ukrainian people from the Nazis. That's the image he is pushing day by day, a strong man fighting a heroic war and a nation united behind him. Putin even cited scripture to justify the invasion. But Putin's carefully crafted image does not reflect the reality on the ground in neighboring Ukraine. Today, protesters in the city of Lviv placed more than 100 strollers in the town square to represent the number of children killed in the war so far. In the southern port city of Mariupol, rescue efforts are underway to find the hundreds of people who are trapped under the rubble of a theater which was reportedly bombed by Russian forces while a thousand civilians sheltered inside. In that same city, where two AP journalists have been the only international media present, people have been stuck with nowhere to go for weeks as the city is besieged by Russian forces. Quote, food is running out. The Russians have stopped humanitarian attempts to bring it in. Electricity is mostly gone. Water is sparse, with residents melting snow to drink. Some parents have even left their newborns at the hospital, perhaps hoping to give them a chance at life in the one place with decent electricity and water. That is, I would submit, the real face of Putin's war. Reality that more people in Russia may understand than the Kremlin is letting on. While many attendees at Putin's rally today undoubtedly support the president and his war, that is not the case for all of them, at least according to one BBC reporter who was present. Quote, many said they worked in the public sector, that they'd been pressured into attending by their employers. One man who works in the Moscow metro told reporters he and other employees have been forced to attend the rally. Students told us they'd been given the option of a day off from lectures if they attended, quote, a concert. Some of them didn't even know the event was dedicated in part to support for Russian forces in Ukraine. It is quite literally political theater, a kind of textbook set piece of a strongman. And it's worth taking a step back and looking at the context in which Putin rose to the ranks, both in and after the fall of the Soviet Union. Here's how NBC Nightly News reported on Putin being appointed as Russia's prime minister back in 1999. Out of the shadows of Russia's spy service, a new prime minister, Vladimir Putin, a man of little political experience but a long career in espionage. Most recently, head of the shadowy Federal Security Service, formerly the KGB, longtime spy in Germany, secretary of Yeltsin's advisory council, the sensitive, powerful Kremlin inner circle, and fiercely loyal to the president. And in another surprise, Yeltsin today names Putin just not acting prime minister, but also his choice for president in next year's election. Now, notably, just a month after that report aired, Putin solidified his power by positioning himself as a strongman in response to a series of horrific apartment bombings across Russia, which left more than 300 dead. The attacks were formally blamed on Chechen terrorists, but there are quite, is quite a bit of suspicion to this day surrounding who actually set off those bombs. The bombings provide an excuse for Putin to order a ground invasion of Chechnya, launching the Second Chechen War. And that is how Putin came to power. But even before that, before he got his start, that he got his start in the Soviet intelligence services, the notorious and secretive KGB, where, of course, subversion, deception were the norm. As a Russian journalist, Sergei Dobrynin, recounts in a fantastic piece for The Atlantic about Putin's rise to power, here is how one leftist dissident academic in Russia described him, Putin, at the time of his ascension. Quote, he is a Czechist, meaning an agent of the secret police. Once a Czechist, always a Czechist. He is pure evil. Once a member of the secret police, always a member of the secret police. It is how Putin operates. He appears to retain within him a tie to the worst aspects of the Soviet Union's shadowy totalitarianism, at least according to his behavior in recent weeks. You see, there is an entire field of study, it now feels antique, but it was uh, all the rage for a while, called Kremlinology. It rose to prominence during the Cold War uh, because, of course, there was no free press in the Soviet Union at the time and therefore no public cover coverage of external political debate. But just because there was none of that, right, and most decisions were made through secret back channels, didn't mean there weren't politics inside the Soviet Union, and there were, of course, lots of it. And it meant that you had to learn to read between the lines to discover what those politics were, which factions were ascendant, 
And who was on the outs with party leadership? Who wielded what power? What debates were happening within the party leadership? And again, it's weird that we find ourselves here in 2022 in the 21st century, but it's sort of what observers are left doing once again. At this point, after the passage of the new law outlawing the use of the word war, essentially tamping down on what was left of the independent Russian free press, there's no real, real free Russian press reporting on the inner workings of Putin's government. So we are left trying to divine his thoughts and plans and the formations of whatever factions and controversies there might be in his inner circle from what little information we do have. There are reports that two of Putin's top officials are under house arrest for the supposed crime of not giving the president the right information ahead of the invasion. Obviously, if he was told that they were going to take Kiev in a matter of days, you can imagine he's pretty angry about that. A study by the Institute for the Study of War indicated that he may be purging military and intelligence personnel. All of that is in contrast, of course, to Putin's public shows of strength, not just at the rally, but also his public addresses using frankly Stalinist language, comparing dissenters to insects and calling for a cleansing of society from subversive Western influence. There is also reporting that Putin called Turkey's President Erdogan to begin conversations about what a potential peace deal with Ukraine might look like. Keep in mind, the current peace talks are happening in Turkey. And what concessions he would demand from Ukrainian President Zelensky's government. Now, again, as we covered on the program yesterday and we've been covering all along, it, it's just hard to know how serious those talks are. But one thing that does seem clear from all the reporting we have, and again, again, this is sort of a black box, it's sort of opaque, but to the best that we can tell from the reporting we have, from the observations of what we're seeing, taken all together, reading between the lines, it would appear at the very least that Putin does not believe this war is going as planned. Whether that leads to an off-ramp or a doubling down on the atrocities he is currently, to this hour and minute, leveling on the Ukrainian people remains to be seen. Because, unfortunately, so much right now of the world's suffering and misery and the reverberating effects of it is wrapped up in the frustrations and the psyche of this one man, a Czechist through and through. The president detailed, um, uh, you know, what the implications and consequences would be if China provides material support to Russia um, as it conducts brutal attacks against Ukrainian cities and civilians. And obviously that is something we will be watching and the world will be watching. For nearly two hours today, President Biden spoke with Chinese leader Xi Jinping over a secure video link. According to readouts from both countries, the war in Ukraine was, of course, a major topic of discussion. After the call, Chinese government press, a Chinese government press release said, quote, the Ukraine crisis is not something we want to see, and conflict and confrontation are not in anyone's interest, and peace and security are what the international community should treasure the most. While well, the readout from the White House said President Biden described the implications and consequences if China provides material support to Russia in Ukraine, adding that he underscored his support for a diplomatic resolution to the crisis and said that the two leaders also agreed on the importance of maintaining open lines of communication. I'm joined now by someone who knows firsthand all about dealing with China as well as Russia. Kevin Rudd served as both prime minister and foreign minister for Australia. He's the author of The Avoidable War, warning about potential conflict between the U.S., and China. Um, Prime Minister, I, I, I know that this is an area of deep expertise for you, and specifically because of where Australia is on the globe. Um, you have strong relationships with the quote-unquote West, with the U.S., and also, obviously, China is very proximate to you. What is your assessment of the calculation here by the Chinese government and the diplomatic goals of the Biden administration, how achievable they are? Well, I, for the last several years, I've been president of an American think tank uh, here in New York. And so um, we try and take a global perspective on this. I think uh, Xi Jinping's objectives are basically along these lines. That, number one, uh, he presides over a government which has been seeking to use its uh, relationship with Russia uh, to give it as much latitude as possible uh, to... Um, uh, expand its uh, regional and global uh, assertiveness against the United States. That's the first point. I think the second is uh, that uh, the uh, Chinese and the uh, Russians in the UN Security Council collaborate on all manner of things, whether it's from the Middle East uh, to uh, other trouble spots in the world. Uh, 
And again, there's a concerted challenge to the US-led international system. And finally, there's something of what I describe as a Xi Jinping, Vladimir Putin bromance, uh, reflected in the photographs currently on your screen, which is uh, these authoritarian hard men with a common view that they are, quote, men of history and seeking to roll back the tide of the American-dominated liberal international order. Put all that together, that's where the Chinese are coming from. I think what the United States in this most recent exchange uh, today between President Biden and President Xi Jinping was trying to articulate clearly was if China decides to provide material financial or material military support to uh, Putin's Russia at this time for use in Ukraine, then this will invite uh, an American reaction to China. And that is the core communication which I think President Biden sought to deliver. I think the message has been received. The open question is, what will China do in the weeks ahead on these two questions? Yeah, just to the, the, the background here of, of some of those photos, you know, 20 days before the invasion, there was this big announcement uh, between the two countries that they had a, a friendship that has no limits, uh, a phrase which can't help but be funny to me. Um, there are no forbidden areas of cooperation, nothing taboo, apparently, between the two. The two countries said uh, in, in a joint in a joint statement, um, I, I have to say, I would love your wisdom and experience here. So the U.S. keeps saying, look, there's reports that, that, that Russia has asked explicitly for essentially rearmament from the Chinese. And the U.S. has said publicly they, they think that's the case and they fear the warning against it. It does seem to me like that would be a very proactive and provocative step by the Chinese and unnecessary. I, I, I guess I don't understand the upside for them in something going that far how realistic do you think that is? You know, Beijing, to some extent, is divided on these questions. I mean, I've spent the better part of 30 or 40 years rolling my head around these questions in one form or another, back to when I was a junior woodchuck in the Australian Foreign Service serving in our embassy in Beijing way back when, um, and looking at the prism of Russia-China relations ever since. You see, I think the, the, the bottom line is that... Uh, Xi Jinping has a view of Putin that they have a common cause against the United States, which represents a force multiplier for China's global diplomatic project and its regional mm -hmm. efforts even in Asia uh, to um, uh, roll back uh, the US-dominated uh, uh, order. And furthermore, what Russia does by virtue of its actions in Syria and in Europe, like in Ukraine, is it diverts American attention. It diverts mm -hmm. the uh, strategic focus of the United States away from uh, the China challenge. So for those reasons, she has an enormous attachment to keeping Putin and Putin's Russia uh, operational. I know the counter arguments, which is uh, the Europeans, historically fairly benign towards China, are now seeing China through a different lens. Secondly, uh, the international community and the developing world is now voting uh, against the Russian invasion, despite China sitting to the sidelines. And on top of that, there's always this danger that uh, what Putin is doing, uh, in fact, invites American financial sanctions down on China's head, and what I would describe as the Armageddon option. And all those things act against China's material interests, but never underestimate that for a Marxist-Leninist regime like the one in Beijing, Politics and security always come first, and they trump mm -hmm. economics. And that's the dangerous zone that we're in. All right. Uh, that was really illuminating. Former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, now the head of the Asia Society. Thank you very much.